Back in the 80s there, there was a, there was a push for ponded pastures and uh, what it allowed you to do was basically drought proof your place. So exactly when you needed that feed in that dry time of the year, that dry brown time of the year, you've got this beautiful lush ponded pasture that you can pull back on. And uh, some of the local uh, grazers here uh, started developing it and, um, and obviously you're looking over the fence and, and the neighbours are saying, wow, look at that. That used to be all water and you know wasteland, ducks and whatnot. Now I've got a paddock potted pasture, and there's extensive areas of it in Queensland. Um, look, it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful tool. It's a cattleman's dream, but it's a barrow's nightmare. <laughs> so the environmental considerations, I, I guess nobody really knew just how invasive those grasses can be. Um, we bought grass here from Markland Station, just down at Kamala. Uh, we bought it in a hessian bag, a couple of fertiliser bags, and in the 80s. Um, Little old me walked through there and uh, it was my brother and my father and uh, we planted the runners in there. We pressed them into the mud with our bare feet and um, the rest is history. <laughs> it's been very successful, <laughs> too successful almost. It, it takes landholders like Jason to be proactive and see, see the side or see the benefit that they can get from not only improving the environmental side of things but how some of the works that we're suggesting might also benefit their farming operations. Um, once, once that demonstration has occurred, uh, generally we find that many more landholders uh, are willing to take that on. So in terms of um, working with the, the pasture species like hymenacne in particular and paragrass and a few other the ones that can cause water quality issues, because they're so integral to the, to the farming operations, they really don't want to reduce the amount of cover that's that's on it uh, that's on their farms from a, an environmental perspective and from a fisheries perspective in particular hymenacne if left unchecked it can overrun wetlands modified and natural wetlands um, to a point where no fish will want to live in there the water quality by the end of the dry season um, in particular the dissolved oxygen is, is pretty much zero and then when you do get those rains the water flowing through those dense stands of hymenacne um, are so depleted in oxygen that no fish want to swim up there. So where we can work with a landholder like Jason where he, he's willing to create these refuge pools where um, it's deep enough for that the fish, so that the fish can persist into the dry season. The area of open water is large enough that the water quality can be maintained. So the hymenacne doesn't encroach so far in that it, it, it forms an impenetrable um, cover over the water surface because a large part of the water quality, in particular dissolved oxygen, is diffusion from the atmosphere. So where we've got windy days like today, you get a lot of um, surface movement on the water which allows the oxygen to transfer from the atmosphere down into the water column. It, this is the end of the dry season so it's about as much of hymenacne growth as you're going to get before the water starts receding um, and the water quality results were, were perfectly within tolerance limits so we had uh, over 80 percent saturation for dissolved oxygen, pH was fine within normal limits um, so the fish are very happy and yeah, we got many, many species um, captured today, which was great results. We're going to manage it by, by grazing, because the alternative is uh, chemical control. There's something about spraying glyphosate into the 20 hectares of wetland environment that just doesn't feel right with that biodiversity in there. So I really wanted a win-win situation where I could keep that hymen acne, because it's an important part of my business here, but keep it under control. The cattle will utilise that in the dry times and they, they will exactly when you want it and they will chew it down close to the ground. And then if you time that correctly, the wet season comes along, it puts a metre or so of water over and that really knocks the hymenacne around. It doesn't kill it, but it definitely subdues it, which is the perfect scenario. So that's the balance we're trying to, to achieve. And the, the project actually gives me the ability to manipulate the water levels in that lagoon uh, to, to the point where coming towards the wet season, if it's still too high, because the cattle don't like to go out there and graze up to their belly in water, but they do love following the, the water in. So, so I can manipulate the water level, the fish are still happy, they've got their refuge pools and their channels, and the cattle are following that hymenacne in, which is doing good things for my bank balance, it's doing good things for the control of hymenacne, it's a win-win situation. Jason has been doing ongoing 
sort of environmental restoration working in with his cattle grazing operations for a number of years now um, but just over the last few years there's been a funding opportunity to work in the wetland itself. Uh, the, the bulk of the earthworks were done in the dry season of 2022 and that included digging larger refuge pools, um, connecting those refuge pools with a deeper channel and then levelling out some of the areas to improve the drainage during the dry season so you're not left with pockets of, of shallow water where um, the water quality can get quite bad and then when it rains again that poor water quality can enter the main wetland and cause issues for the other fish that are in there. Um, and then as part of those works we also did a, a fish ladder that was to improve connectivity between the estuary which is right next door and the freshwater ponded pastures. I didn't realise the, the amount of work and design and the, and the effort that had to go into that simple pathway that I'd asked for to facilitate the movement. So a lot of science has gone into it, a lot of work has gone into it and uh, I'm, I'm so happy with the result. And uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a great feeling to stand there with the water flowing down that ladder, knowing that in the past there was only, you know, depending on the rainfall event, a couple of days maybe where fish might have had the opportunity to get in, now, now it flows for a couple of weeks and that whole time fish are utilising that. And it's quite fascinating to see the productivity of those systems. When you see the amount of fish and the amount of wildlife that are feeding on those fish, the ecosystem that it's, that it's uh, supplying, it, it, it's quite sobering. So, so my goal is to get those fish back out, to allow them to complete their life cycle, like they should, like nature intends, and to get them back out in the marine environment for the enjoyment of everybody. We're seeing results immediately, so we monitored the fishway uh, several weeks ago in that last lot of flow, and I believe we got about 15 or so species, hundreds and hundreds of fish moving per day. Um, today, we got many of those same species, uh, and they've grown significantly. So when they're moving up from the estuary, they might be between 30 and 50 mils long. Some of the fish that we got today were over 100 mils to 200 mils. So that, that's phenomenal growth rates. Excitingly, we, we caught juvenile barramundi, which we're, we're always happy to get. We got a lot of uh, tarpon too, which undertake a similar migration to barramundi. Other, what we call diadromous species, those that breed down in the estuary, move up in the freshwater lowland wetlands, include red scats and silver scats. Also, caught a, a giant herring, which is, which is quite impressive. They get quite large, uh, an oceanic and move out to, uh, around the reefs even when they get larger. Of the 15 species we recorded migrating through the fishway, 14 of them were native and one was invasive, that's a mosquito fish or gambusia, which is quite common throughout the east coast. There are quite a few of them in the wetland at the moment. Effectively, this wetland started from, from zero, no fish. So the only two opportunities fish have had to migrate in are two plow events this year. And the first fish to get in here and breed quite successfully are gambusia, but also from doing the electro fishing, we just caught literally thousands of eastern rainbow fish. So they're also the start of the food chain. Caught lots of bony brim also. The scats that moved in at 30, 40 millimetres are now 110, 120 millimetres. Same with the tarpon, they moved in at sort of 50 to 60 millimetres, they're now 140 mils. They go about 30 millimetres a year. I grew up in this creek system, so I, I knew them intimately. And I, and I, and I love fishing, and uh, we've always had boats, and, and progressively over the years I've gone further and further offshore. And One of my favourite things to do now is go really offshore and, uh, and, and go remote, and we're so lucky here in Mackay region that I can go 120 nautical miles out and, uh, and I can see the reef and it's beautiful and it's powerful and it's still there in 2023. So whatever I can do to facilitate with my little patch here, that link with that magnificent resource, I want to do it.